UFC 209 this weekend in Las Vegas, Nevada from the T-Mobile Arena, specifically Saturday, March 4th on pay-per-view. Seven fights will be shown on the undercard with three on the UFC Fight Pass and four on Fox Sports 1, of course, with the main card, five cards there on the pay-per-view broadcast. Before I get to UFC 209 and my picks, of course, for the main card here on Beyond the Cage, Bellator has an event Friday, March 3rd, Bellator 174. That's from uh, one of their favorite locations there in Thackerville, Oklahoma, at the Windstar World Casino and Resort. It will be the second-ever women's championship fight in Bellator history, and it will be the first-ever women's fight that will be the main event of a Bellator card as well, as Marlis Kunin will take on Julia Budd for their first-ever featherweight women's championship for Bellator in their first title since uh, that was Zoila Frostow. That was, boy, maybe six <laughs> years ago or so when she was the strawweight champion. Now, this is a very interesting situation because Kunin was supposed to fight Julia Budd for the championship, I believe, back at Bellator 155. That was May of last year. She had an upset loss to Alexis Dufresne. It looked as though Dufresne was then going to take on Julia Budd. Uh, Dufresne has not since fought since then, so I'm not sure if she got injured or what the case may be, maybe because she missed weight for that event. Again, it was on short notice. I, uh, I'm i not really sure. However, we're still going to get Kuhn and Bud. Bud has not fought since defeating Arlene Blenko at Bellator 162. Uh, that was by majority decision back in October of last year. So we will get Kuhn and Bud. These two have been around the game uh, for a very long time. Bud started her professional career back in October of 2010, fighting the likes of Jerain Duranami, Ronda Rousey, Amanda Nunes, Charmaine Tweet, along the way uh, beating the likes of uh, Tweet and Duranami, actually, uh, did lose to Nunes and Ronda Rousey. Uh, also, uh, and obviously, Kunin's fought some of the best in the world, too, like uh, Cyborg, Misha Tate, Sarah Kaufman, Liz Carmouche, Roxanne Modafferi, Cindy Dandewai, uh, Roxanne Modafferi again. Uh, fought a lot over in Japan in earlier career. She's been fighting professionally for 17 years, has the Dutch woman uh, Marlis Kunin, has compiled an impressive record of 23-7 and seven, with 17 of those wins coming by submission. Uh, Julia Budd really uh, has just always been a very uh, physical specimen, uh, the British Columbia Canadian native. 9-2 and two overall, a career with five decisions. She really imposes her will. And I really see this being a grappling contest. Neither is that great in the stand-up department. I really this is going to be the top game of Bud against the bottom and submission game of Marlos Kunin. It's really who's going to win out. And Kunin's taken on really big and strong and powerful girls before. I mean, she did last four rounds against Cyborg Santos before finally succumbing to punches and elbows uh, from the Brazilian. So she definitely can take a beating. That That is the case. And this being a five-round fight, she's been in there She's a veteran. I would probably favor Marlis Kuna. I think eventually she's going to be able to either get a submission or a reverse position on Julia Budd, and I think Julia Budd's going to wear out. I don't think she'll be able to really last that full allotment of time. Uh, Kunin's not a real big 145er, has fought some of her career at 135 pounds. So to me, I, I think that this is all the makings for her pulling a submission, uh, especially perhaps... Uh, probably rounds three or four if it goes into there. But if Bud, Bud really to me has to explode early and try to do something to catch Kuhn off game, because she goes with the, what she's shown so far in her three Bellator fights, which has been just a very grinding, kind of slow pace style, just really dominating people with position, I, I don't think you're going to beat Kuhn in that way. She really has to step up and try to go for a finish, something that she doesn't have a lot of. Uh, four finish victories, five decisions, uh, and has not had a finish win in three in now going on four years. So not a type of fighter that just really goes for the finish, and I think she's going to have to in this fight if she wants a chance to become uh, a Bellator champion. We're also going to see uh, Mike Biggie Rhodes, uh, who actually has fought at welterweight previously in the UFC and the RFA. He's moving up to middleweight to take on former Ultimate Fighter winner Kendall Grove. Actually pretty excited about that one. Um, we'll see how that goes. 
Now we have Fernando Gonzalez against Brandon Gertz. Brandon Gertz, uh, a guest of the show here. This is an interesting concept. Gertz, of course, has fought the majority of his career at 155. Lost a, uh, you know, he was coming off an injury and everything. Didn't look quite the same there against Adam uh, Piccolotti, which did snap a three-fight winning streak for Gertz, beating the likes of Melvin Gillard and Derek Campos along the way. And I don't know if this is Gertz moving up or Gonzalez moving down. Gonzalez, not an overly big welterweight at only 5'9". So this could be him moving down. Of course, take on the likes of Michael Venom Page, who I believe is like a 6'2 guy. Maybe they kind of realize, like, man, it's hard to get inside on some of these guys, uh, despite having wins over some really good competitors like Carl Amasu, Carl Parisian, uh, Marius Zaramskis, and Gilbert Smith uh, in what was his five-fight winning streak before losing to Michael Page last November. So Gonzalez at 155 should be really interesting. Regardless of what weight class he is, he's a guy that fights at a very frenetic, uh, frenetic pace, has a lot of output, and this should be a fun fight with uh, Brandon Gertz, who definitely obviously has some power and good wrestling ability as well. So I'm excited for those two fights coming up here at Bellator 174. Also featured Do Joe Timangla will take on Steve Garcia. And also uh, former UFC fighter Cody Pfister will take on Jonathan Gray. And also the big pygmy himself, Justin Wren, will be taking on Roman Palazzo. Uh, and also, she had a really good fight. Uh, Emily Ducati will take on Katie Collins. That's going to be in their flyweight division. And speaking of Alexis Dufresne, she's actually going to be on this card. Again, a little funny. Like I said, I'm not sure what happened there. Maybe because she missed weight, they didn't give her the uh, fight. But Alexis Dufresne will be taking on Gabrielle Holloway. And i got to believe if Dufresne can A, make weight, and B, beat Holloway, you got to believe that she's next for the winner of Coonan and Bud, especially if Coonan wins, considering she does have that submission win over Marlis Coonan. So that should be uh, interesting to see how that works. And those are some of the fights there on the undercard. But pretty solid card here for Bellator, Bellator 174. Looking forward to it on Friday night. But as I mentioned, UFC 209 happening on Saturday. Real quick look at the prelims. We're going to have uh, Tyson Pedro against Paul Craig in the light heavyweight division. Paul Craig, known as the Bear Jew, taking on Tyson Pedro, who had a really uh, awesome UFC debut. The Australian native won his UFC debut by uh, knockout. That was over Khalil Roundtree. Uh, so he's a very, that's the highlight fight there. Also, uh, Michigan's own Amanda Bobby Cooper will return. She's taking on Cynthia Calvillo. Uh, who is undefeated at 3-0. This will be Cooper's third fight in the UFC, the first since uh, beating Almos in her last fight uh, back in Ireland. And we also have Albert Morales against Andre Southkinthas, if I said that correctly. On the FS1 portion of the prelims, Mark Godbeer will be taking on Daniel Spitz. Early Alcantara will be taking on Luke Sanders. That's in the bantamweight division. The Godbeer Spitz fight will be at heavyweight. Uh, Morales Southcam was at a bantamweight, so uh, yeah. All right. Moving on, we have Mursad Betik against Derek Elkins. This is a pretty big fight here for Mursad Betik. Probably the best fighter he's ever taken on Derek Elkins. Two guys towards the end there in the top 15 of the featherweight division. Betik so far undefeated in his career, 11-0. 4-0 so far in the UFC, finishing his last two fights, being two solid competitors in Lucas Martins and Russell Doan. But Darren Elkins is a guy that's a grinder. He's a tough out. Gr uh, Elkins is on a nice winning streak. He's won four out of his last five, including uh, a big win over Godfredo Pepe in his last fight. So this should be a very big step up in competition for Betik. This definitely... Elkins has kind of been a gatekeeper of sorts here at 145. I think he moved down, let's see, probably, let's see, it looks like he fought Dwayne Ludwig in 2010, so probably somewhere around that 2010-2011 mark, he moved down from 155 to 145. So he's kind of been a gatekeeper of sense. He's won, a, he's won three or four, then he loses against someone near elite. So if Betta can get by Elkins, it proves that he's ready for the next step in competition. So that's that's a solid fight there at 145. And highlighting the FS1 prelims is going to be in heavyweight as Luis Henrique will take on Marcin Tybura. 
So we'll see how that goes one uh, Brazil against Poland in that one. Getting to the main card, though. Speaking of heavyweights, this one super excited for in the heavyweight division as Alistar Overeem will take on Mark Hunt. Looking at Alistar Overeem, he lost his last fight. That was for the UFC Heavyweight Championship. That was back at UFC 203 last fall. That snapped a four-fight four winning streak for the Dutch native Overeem, who overall sits at a record of 41-15 and 15 with a no contest. In the UFC, 6-4, and four, and 37 of his 41 victories are by finish with 19 submissions and 18 knockouts. Looking at Mark Hunt, his last fight was a loss, but overturned by the Nevada State Athletic Commission to a no contest. That was at UFC 200 with his fight against Brock Lesnar. So his overall record, 12-2-1 with a no contest, and overall in the UFC, 7-4-1. That no contest against Brock Lesnar snapped a two-fight winning streak uh, after knocking out the likes of Antonio Silva and Frank Mir uh, towards the end of 2015 and, of course, to the begin. 2016. These two have actually fought before. They fought all the way back at the Dream 5, uh, which was their lightweight Grand Prix final card, and Overeem actually submitted Mark Hunt in the first round via key lock. So this will be the second time they have fought, and I think they may have come across each other in the kickboxing arena. I'm not 100% sure, about, but they were both kickboxing in K1 around that time. Um, so this should be very interesting, two of arguably the best kickboxers to ever turn mixed martial artist. But the big thing about this, you have Overeem at 6'5", Mark Hunt at 5'10". Overeem is the more well-rounded fighter. You know, Hunt, while still a knockout power, it's going to be tough for him to get inside. And while I, Mark Hunt has the ability to knock out anybody in this division, I think Overeem uses that range, either stays outside with kicks, or immediately takes Mark Hunt down, and I think could very easily submit him again. Uh, I, I really think this is Overeem's fight to lose. Overeem's still very really re relevant, because even though he did get knocked out in the first round by Stipe Miocic, he definitely had Miocic hurt at points in that time. So to me, he's not completely gone away. He does have a win over, obviously, Fabricio for Doom as well, and a win over Junior Dos Santos, who is now going to be fighting for the championship. So a win over Mark Hunt really puts him right back into the title picture. And even though he's been in the UFC for a few years now, obviously signed all the way back in 2011, that was only his first shot at the title. And it was an exciting fight. So if he beats Mark Hunt, he's really right back in the thick of things. And for Mark Hunt, obviously there was a lot of disputes about his contest there against Brock Lesnar. He was... I. I, as far as I know, the New Zealand native is actively suing the UFC, so there's a whole thing with that. Obviously, Mark Hunt's pretty much a, he's an exciting guy, and any anybody he fights, I don't think he's ever had a boring fight in the UFC. The only fight I thought was really bad was his fight against Ben Rothwell. But other than that, he's put on some really exciting fights in the UFC. Uh, however, he's now 42 years old. I don't know how much he has left in the tank, uh, even though he's only had 24 mixed martial arts bouts he's had you know a, a lot of kickboxing bouts too so i you know you know that overeem's a spring chicken at 36 but that's still a six years difference and not not to mention the size i really think this is this is overeem's fight getting into the next fight of the evening that's going to be in the lightweight division as two up-and-comers will take on each other as david tamar will take on lando venata david tamar was on the tough season there, Europe versus USA, Faber versus McGregor. Uh, since being on that season, he has won two fights in the UFC, running his record to 5-1, and one, four of five wins by knockout, including uh, his most recent two uh, and only two fights in the UFC, both by knockout in the second round, most recently Jason Novelli back at UFC Fight Night 92 in August of last year. Lando Venata, after debuting and even though losing, had a very exciting debut and lost to Tony Ferguson, who's obviously fighting on this card for the interim lightweight championship, losing in the second round uh, via choke, but had uh, Tony hurt a few times. That was exclamated in his follow-up UFC effort, knocking out John McDessie in what a lot of people picked as the knockout of the year with a perfect spinning back kick to the face of McDessie, knocking out the Canadian there in the first round at UFC 206. Both guys have knockout power, both have finishing power. Venata has actually finished eight of his nine victories, nine and one 
overall, four knockouts and four submissions. Now, even though Tamar has had four knockouts in his career, he didn't really show that a lot on the show. Obviously, he didn't have that many opportunities. But I, I think that Lando's a little more well-rounded and I think has the better potential to finish this one. Uh, not to say Tamar is bad or anything, just I've really liked what I've seen from Venata. And while Tamar has you know, beaten two guys and knocked them out, at the same time, Martin Svensson and Jason Novell are nowhere near John McDessie, who's been in the UFC for several years. And of course, Tony Ferguson, arguably the best lightweight in the world and has a chance to prove that uh, on this very card. And... Really, to me, this fight is here because of Venata. It's not for Tamor. And while Tamor obviously has a chance, I mean, I'm not acting like Venata is a world beater ever. Just I like what I've seen so far from Venata in better competition than I have seen against Tamar. Although, again, you can only beat what's put in front of you, and Tamar has passed so far with flying colors. And maybe now that he's taking on a little better opponent, we'll really see what he's made of. But that's a very intriguing fight with two young guys here in the lightweight division. Looking at... The next fight of the evening, the middleweight division, Rashad Evans, former winner of the Ultimate Fighter at heavyweight, will be making his first ever attempt at middleweight, and he's been fighting in the UFC since 2005 was his first ever fight, nearly 12 years ago, now making his way down to 185 pounds, his third weight class that he would fight, taking on the... Uh, former judo Olympic medalist in Dan Kelly, who has a very impressive record of 5-1 and one in the UFC, 12-1 and one overall. He has five submissions out of those 12 wins. Evans, 19-5 uh, and five with a draw, 10 of 19 wins by decision overall in the UFC. Like I said, been fighting since 205. Evans, 14-5-1. Kelly, 5-1 and one in the UFC. Kelly most recently defeated Chris Camozzi, which I considered somewhat of an upset at UFC Fight Night 101. And Evans lost his last fight to Glover and has lost his last two since returning to action in October of 2015, losing both those efforts, now dropping down to 185 at 37 years old. You may think, well, Dan Kelly's 39, though, Jim. I get Dan Kelly's 39, but Dan Kelly's been fighting at 185 at least his whole UFC career. Rashad Evans hasn't, and you add in having to make that weight cut, the bit of a significant weight cut, even if he only walks around at 215, that's now 30 pounds. In this era, with all these restrictions and got more guys are prone to move up than move down these days, and I don't know, I, I think that's an unknown. He's never had to cut that much weight before. He's on the downside of his career, and even though he's taking a guy that's two years older of him, Dan Kelly has been a lot more active in the last few years, and has looked pretty good. I mean, his last fight against Chris Camozzi, I thought he looked really excellent, dominated... Uh, a guy, again, I thought he was going to lose to. And then Antonio Carlos Jr., I feel, is a very talented fighter. And I thought he was really able to control the fight and ended up knocking him out. So I think that since losing to Sam Alvey, I think Dan Kelly has looked really good and has fought some solid-level competition in that time. And I, I don't know. I, you know, this is Evan's last last go of it. And if this doesn't go well, you got to look at, I, I think he should be retired anyway. But... If he loses to Dan Kelly, he definitely has to look in the mirror and realize, you know, should I still be doing this? And how much of a toll, you know, the injuries he's been through, and obviously now with this weight cut, I'm not saying he can again, anybody has a chance, but boy, uh, it, it's definitely an intriguing matchup. It could end up being, again, the end of Rashad Evans, a former champion, the ultimate fighter, the first fighter that was a winner of the ultimate fighter to become a UFC champion. Or, I'm sorry, the second. I forgot he'd be four scripts. So, the second. But, uh, you know, he's obviously a, been, been a stalwart for many years for the UFC, and this could be uh, his final fight here at UFC 209. So, we'll see how that goes. But he definitely has his work cut out for him uh, against Dan Kelly. But technically speaking, Rashad has the better stand up. If he can keep it standing, I would say he can win. But if it gets inside the clinch, even though Rashad does have a very good wrestling background, I think Dan Kelly's proved that he can, I mean, he outgrappled Antonio Carlos Jr. So I have no doubts that he could outgrapple Rashad Evans. I don't, I don't think that, that's a stretch at all. But Evans is going to have to be able to get out of those clinches against and then get it to and work the footwork again, weight cut. We'll see. It, it's an interesting fight, but uh, yeah, we'll see if it's Rashad's last. 
Co-main event of the evening for the interim lightweight championship. The winner will face Conor McGregor at some point here in 2016 as Habib Nurmagomedov will take on Tony Ferguson. These guys are sitting one and two respectively in the lightweight division according to the UFC. Of course, the champion is above everybody. Habib, a perfect 24-0, and he has eight knockouts, eight submissions, and eight decision victories. You very rarely see a fighter with that type of split. Uh, he entered the UFC back in 2012, has won eight in a row in the organization, being the likes of Kamal Shahrus, Gleason Tebow, Tiago Tavares, Rafael Dos Anjos, and most recently, Michael Johnson back at UFC 205, submitting Johnson in the third round, arguably his best performance so far in the octagon. And every test that the Russian has been put up against, he has passed and has passed with flying colors. He has not had a fight other than getting a little bit caught early there against Michael Johnson, that's about the only difficulties he's really had so far in the UFC. And for Tony Ferguson, he's had a very similar uh, path of dominance, 22-3 and three in his career. 17 of his 22 victories are by finish, 9 knockouts, 8 submissions. He has put together a very impressive 12-1 and one UFC record. Has not since lost to losing to Michael Johnson. Back in 2012, that was very early in his career. That was only his fourth UFC fight. Since that point, uh, he has rattled off nine consecutive victories, being the likes of Danny Castillo, Gleason Tebow, Josh Thompson, Edson Barbosa, and most recently former lightweight champion Rafael Dos Anjos back in November uh, at 8,000 feet elevation in Mexico City and went five rounds and could have looked like he won another five rounds. And to me, that was maybe one of the most impressive performances I've ever seen. Adding in the elevation, the output that he did, the way he handled a very good fighter in Rafael Dos Anjos, a guy that, that, that fight was competitive. It not, was completely one-sided. I think how Dos Anjos definitely won a round, maybe two in that. It wasn't definitely completely one-sided, but Tony just kept on coming. And Dos Anjos, while a good stand-up fighter, if it was just left to being a stand-up fight, you had to favor Tony Ferguson uh, as opposed to it being a ground battle where Dos Anjos is a very good Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. And while Tony Ferguson obviously has some good submission skills, like I said, has submitted eight opponents and obviously ha has some good chokes, that obviously is a fight that you would favor Rafael Dos Anjos long-term in a jiu-jitsu match. So for him to do that for the 25 minutes to me thinks that Tony Ferguson can be anybody anywhere at any time doing whatever he wants and for Habib a guy that is a very tremendous grappler let's not get that twisted he is a tremendous grappler however he's taking on a guy that I, I don't think can ever run out of gas he's going to be hard to finish and while Habib does have some knockouts to his credit he's not a very he's not a knockout heavy guy he's really looking to just dominate you out demoralize you and then he eventually will get a submission because you break mentally. And Tony Ferguson is not a guy that breaks mentally. And obviously, Habib is a guy that's never been t in a five-round fight. Uh, I don't. Th he's been scheduled. I don't think he's been scheduled for a five-round fight. I'm not sure going back to his days fighting in, in Russia and M1, but at least in the UFC, he's never been in a, a five-round scheduled fight. That, to me, is new. Tony Ferguson has been. I know it was his last fight, but having that one kind of out of the way I think really helps and I think he's taken on a little better competition too and obviously he hasn't had really to go through the, the injury problems there like Habib and I, I really think this is Tony Ferguson's time and while Habib I think Habib early will probably be able to take Tony Ferguson down I don't see that being an issue, but I don't think that he's going to be able to hold him there for five rounds. I think eventually Ferguson's going to get loose. We saw Habib definitely has holes in his game in the stand-up. I think Tony's going to be able to expose them at some point and get and get a knockout. I I think I think that's that's how I see this fight playing out. Maybe Sabi will prize me and catch Ferguson in a submission, but you know Ferguson's only been submitted once in his career, and that was all the way back in 2009. So it's possible. But uh, he, he's never been knocked out. I, I don't see Habib being the guy to do that. But we'll see. Obviously, this, this is a lot of implications. This is a fight that was actually supposed to happen in April of last year. We now get it March of this year, and I can't wait. This, this is two of the best in the world, and we finally get to see him do battle inside the octagon. I don't care whether it's an interim title or not. It's deserving of being a five-round fight, regardless of any sort of what's next for these two gentlemen. And I'm glad we get to see it, because this is... Um, 
you know, very rare occurrence you get to see two guys on such big a roll like this right in the primes of their careers uh, battling each other, and I'm excited for it. Main event of the evening for the welterweight title for the second time. Tyron Woodley and Stephen Thompson running this one back after their majority draw at UFC 205. Of course, the title does not change hands with a draw, so Woodley, still a champion, has yet to successfully defend the title against the Wonder Boy Stephen Thompson. 8-1-1 one, one in the UFC is Thompson with 7 of 13 wins by knockout. Woodley 6-2-1 in the UFC with 6 of 16 wins by knockout. Really think this fight is going to be very similar to the biggest difference. I don't think Woodley's going to do much different. The biggest difference is the adjustment Stephen Thompson makes. Obviously, Thompson worried about the takedown and the rushing in with the big overhand right of Woodley. Woodley was able to do that quite a few times. Obviously, he had a very dominant fourth round, nearly finishing the South Carolina native. But the biggest difference to me in this fight will be Wonder Boy and engaging Linmore. I think he has to be a little more active. He can't be afraid to be taken down because if you're tentative being taken down, he proved that he could take you down anyway even when you were trying to not get taken down, regardless of how good it is. So I think Thompson just has to abandon that thought, realize I'm probably going to get taken down at some point. There's no sense letting that stop me from throwing my offense. And I think if he stays, throws more of those spinning attacks, throws more of kicks to those body and heads, uh, and just realizes i got to bounce back up and make that his strategy, I think that's the adjustment he has to make. Instead of staying more on the outside, hoping he can land that one big shot. You know, Woodley is a tough guy. Woodley has only been knocked out once in his entire career. That was all the way back against Nate Marquardt, and that was nearly five years ago. Uh, so this is a guy that's only been finished once, has never been submitted, and I don't think Stephen Thompson is going to submit him. And, you know, only, again, only has three losses in a career, so Woodley's really good. So I, I think for, for Thompson, you got to realize you're probably going to get taken out, and I think once he gets past that fact, it's going to make it a whole lot easier for him. And I think that's the biggest adjustment. For Woodley, there's really not changing too much. It's obviously wait for the opportunities, see when you can throw the overhand right, and obviously take him down when the opportunity presents himself. But you can't shoot in haphazardly against Stephen Thompson, and you gotta you got to be able to get inside, and he is obviously proof he can do that. So I think we're going to see a very similar fight. I think we're going to see a winner. However, I think we are going to see a finish one way or the other. I think either uh, Tom... Thompson's going to catch a kick, or Woodley's going to be able to get some ground and pound and finish what he started back at 205. I, I, this is a very close fight. I didn't think it was going to be as close the first time, but you know, it has really left this one up in the air um, from what I originally picked in their first meeting which, when I did pick Stephen Thompson. Now I'm a little more 50-50 uh, when I thought Thompson was going to for sure win that first one. So I'll get my pick here in just a minute. As I get to my picks for the main card here for UFC 209, Going back to the first fight of the evening in the heavyweight division, Mark Hunt against Alistair Overeem. Kind of gave my pick away, but I'm definitely going with Alistair Overeem in this fight. I just think that uh, Hunt's going to have a tough time getting the inside, and Overeem's obviously the more well-rounded individual, so I'm going to go with Alistair Overeem. Lando Venata against David Tamar. Tamar definitely has some skills, but I really like what I've seen so far in Venata in his two fights as opposed to Tamar, so I'm going to go with Groovy Lando to win this one. Rashad Evans against Daniel Kelly. I probably gave it a little, a little bit, but I'm definitely going with Dan and Kelly. I think that he will be able to impose his will on Rashad Evans, who's definitely going to be the slower fighter, I believe. Well, actually, he might be a little faster. But I think that weight cut is going to hurt him, and I, I just don't think Evans is the same fighter he was uh, you know, four or five years ago. So I'm going to go with Dan Kelly in this one. Habib never going made up against Tony Ferguson. While Habib certainly has a very real chance of winning this fight, I think Tony Ferguson is the more well-rounded fighter, can win this fight in more areas, and I also think he's the better conditioned fighter as well. So I'm going to go with Tony Ferguson to win this one. Tyron Woodley against Stephen Thompson. <sighs> Boy, I, I really want to pick Woodley because I he proved a lot to me. I, I've always been a fan of Woodley, but I, I really didn't think he was going to come close to Stephen Thompson in that matchup, and he proved me wrong. And even though it was a draw, he performed better than I thought he was going to against the stylings of Thompson. However, I think Thompson will make the necessary adjustments, and I'm going to go with Stephen Thompson to win this rematch and become the welterweight champion of the world. Once again, I am your host, Jim Graham. 
Thank you for listening, everybody, to Beyond the Cage. You can like Beyond the Cage on Facebook, facebook.com slash Podcast. Follow me on Twitter at Jim Graham and also on Instagram at the Jim Graham. I'd like to thank everybody that supports Beyond the Cage, uh, top-rated MMA, uh, Gorilla the Bear, a.k.a. Adam Nelson. Uh, follow Gorilla the Bear on Twitter and Instagram. Check out his amazing art. You can see it right back there. And, of course, uh, on Facebook, the Beyond the Cage Facebook page as well. Uh, the MMA Community.com, MMA uh, Fight Club on Facebook. Uh, who am I missing here? Sports Talk 313, AJ Hiller at MMA Signatures, uh, dot co. That's the new website there uh, to check out their brand new selection there of the of mixed martial arts memorabilia, the number one site in the world for mixed martial arts memorabilia. And am I missing anybody? I think that's about it. Yes. Well, thank you for listening to another edition here of Beyond the Cage. Uh, I'll be back uh, next week. And see you, everybody. <laughs>